And hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's 5 p.m. And I'm Tina Brock, your host for Into the Absurd. And you've joined us for a 50-minute conversation in which we are going to be exploring all things uh, therapeutic uh, and so many other topics this evening with our guest, Peter Andrew Danzig, who is a career and creativity coach. He is a therapist, and he's going to help us wind our way through the very uh, interesting and existentially challenging times that we are facing right now. So get your questions ready and come on in and join us. And uh, we're just getting everybody into the Zoom room and we're so glad you've joined us. If you have your questions, put them in the chat box and um, we'll get on with our 50 minute conversation now. Peter Andrew Danzig, I have um, been aware of Peter's work in the community and I recently had the opportunity to have a very long conversation with him about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is performance anxiety. And so um, I thought what a wonderful way to sort of illuminate that and bring it into the community and talk about his work as a therapist and what he's finding in his work with creators in the community uh, now. So. With all that said, let's get to this conversation and welcome Peter Andrew Danzig to Into the Absurd. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi, Tina. I'm so excited to be here. Me too. I, uh, welcome, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter, let's start back with your work. Uh, and you, you were at Temple and then you graduated from Villanova and you started theatrical trainer with many steps along the way. But tell me what led you uh, you came out with a degree in theater, correct? Performance. Yeah. So I, uh, when I was an undergrad, I got a BA from Temple University. Uh, musical theater was the concentration. Uh, they were just starting the program at the time, but that was the concentration I was uh, in. And um, yeah, then I worked professionally for from 2002 to about 2014. Uh, nationally on television and film, soap opera work mostly. And um, then I went to graduate school at Villanova and they have a great program. Uh, I was their acting scholar. So the trade-off for there is that you, you act and they pay for your education. It was a really wonderful program. And that's how Theatrical Trainer started. That was my thesis work was looking at the, the biopsychosocial needs of artists in rehearsal because I was seeing so much of it in my career. People like down, uh, questioning audition processes and the, the humanistic or non-humanistic approach that was happening. Um, and so I fell in love with the idea of taking care of people's bodies. Um, and that's that's how theatrical trainers started. I hurt myself during a show and uh, I couldn't afford a trainer, so I, but I could afford the certification. <laughs> so I just did it myself. Um, and then there's been a long journey since then. Uh, of just like caring for the body and realizing how much need there was beyond what my scope of practice was. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't, that people coming to theatrical trainer needed so much more. So uh, in 2018, I went to Bryn Mawr to get a clinical social work approach, uh, becoming a therapist. There's lots of different ways, LPCs, licensed professional counselors, licensed marriage therapist, uh, uh, for me, the social advocacy lens blended really well with the needs of our community and also with also just trauma survivors in general was my scope of area that I wanted to explore. So yeah, licensed as a therapist and, and that's where Theatrical Trainer is planning to grow over the next couple of months is to be looking at case management of artists to advocating with the Actors Fund and lobbying for better supports of artists in our country. Uh, mm -hmm. broadening and maybe looking at you know, finding ways that we can have unionship for other areas of art artist practice not just performance and so it's gonna be a tall order but yeah that's so that's where I'm landing here today <laughs> yeah well it just seems like we were talking before the show today just about um, your practice and the amount of artists and creatives that you're talking to and and the needs and how this pandemic has really created um, an interesting, um, for lack of a better, petri dish in a way for people's anxieties, uh, both about the work that we're not able to do right now on the stage and in uh, these various avenues, but also uh, just what the world events are, are doing for us. Um, you and I talked a little bit um, uh, a month or so ago uh, about the specific area of trauma which you had been working in most recently. and. Um, Tell me a little bit about, tell us about the, the 
what you're seeing right now mm. in that avenue in the world, in your world? I think there's, there's three areas that I'm seeing it for um, trauma survivors who already have been working through trauma in their life. They're being incredibly triggered. Uh, right now, there's a sense of isolation, uh, sensory deprivation, you know, really impacts um, people and creativity. There's, and then separately from that, one of the things that I think we were speaking about is, is the identification of trauma. I have a lot of clients and patients right now who will say to me, oh, gosh, this feels traumatizing, but I know it's not trauma. And, and I ask them through an assessment how they're feeling. And I say, you know, this is trauma. This is collective trauma. There's multiple traumas going on right now. Uh, there is collective trauma from the pandemic inherently. Um, there is systemic and racial trauma. There is uh, gendered trauma and needs there. Um, there's marginalization of, of trans people and their their lack of rights completely in our country. So there's vicarious, and there's vicarious trauma. There's people uh, losing family members or loved ones and not being able to have closure. There is not being able to physically touch intimately people that you care about. And that there's a sense of, of traumaticness that's happening to the body. And truthfully, we haven't had a pandemic 100 some odd years, right? And so we've never had a pandemic in a time when we have social media and we have constant memory um, and information and processing happening, right? So there's no data for what's going on right now. So when people mm -hmm. tell me this, they're like, oh, if this isn't trauma, there are people in the field. I say, well, we don't know that, right? We haven't spent the next five years really researching 10 years. We haven't looked at longitudinal effects of, we barely have just discovered what social media does to depression and anxiety. And you tell me that mm -hmm. we don't know what a pandemic it's doing amidst uh, this political time plus, you know, other kinds of, of, of trauma all going on at once. I'm, I'm fairly certain that we're going to be studying this for a very long time. <laughs> do, you, do you find that people can identify when they come to you the fact that they, they can say, I, I think this is traumatic or it feels traumatic, but can they identify the ways in which it mm -hmm. is limiting, making the world smaller, or does it m manifest itself mostly as anxiety? Mm. I see people not, I, I see people not understanding the manifestations. Uh, it's, I, I, I actually feel like the anxiety is the constant, that's the symptomatic response of the pandemic right now, is the body is anxious because as humans, we like patterns and predictability. That's what our, what our neurology is like, pattern, like we need that. And we are social creatures, whether an introvert or an extrovert, there's still a pack mentality to the ways that we approach our comforts. And so what I find that it's manifesting as mostly in different ways is, is more depressive and panic. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm seeing people's physical responses go straight from, from depression to panic attacks. Mm -hmm. That's what I've seen a lot of, which is, which was, I was unprepared for as a therapist. Mm -hmm. Prepared mm -hmm. for anxiety, then you kind of think about the blind spots. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there is a real sense of threat here. Like I always, mm -hmm. I talk about it like the mouse and the tiger. So when, a, when a, mm -hmm. <laughs> the mouse sees the tiger, it's like, whoa, I'm going to run. Mm -hmm. uh, people can't run right now. They can't leave. And so that's, uh, they, I feel like if you think about that, that's, that gets me feeling more panicked and anxious, but the panic is that I have no control. Mm -hmm. No control over this outside of what we're told we can control it, distance, a mask, but we're still quite unsure about a lot of things. So that is what I see most of the manifestations happening. Uh, and, and loss of identity. There's just so, we never realized how much we are perceived in the world in different ways and it's that we self, in ways we self-identify and so they were all stripped from us in, in many ways like whether we're talking about art like this is a this is a great way to utilize this time this you know irc's approach has been so wonderful i've enjoyed it um and this is great and i but not every artist has that opportunity or or has the capacity right now emotionally or physically to take that 
take on alternative ways to create, but they identified like that, that sense of identity is almost a loss, you know, mm -hmm. an ambiguous loss that we can't name there because we just can't do our thing, you know, we can't do the thing that makes us feel full. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've talked a little bit about, there's a, a book that you and I share a particular um, affinity for, I think Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body, Hold, uh, Body Keeps the Score. And it's a book about um, how the, the body remembers that we, when we have trauma, it isn't so much in the language uh, that we could retell the story of that, of that event uh, for many, many, many years and maybe not see ourselves making progress because mm -hmm. we attach emotional touch points, if that's correct. Correct me if I'm misinterpreting that. Um, so that's, it, it, it is a, is it a going back? It really is a more complicated rewiring, is mm -hmm. it not, of the certain aspects of the brain? And how do we get there? Mm -hmm. How do we mm -hmm. go back? Mm -hmm. I wanted, I, was very geeky in my approach to the body keeps the score today um, through a Beckett quote, actually. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I just, I, I, I'm going to read the quote and then I'm going to go through your question with the quote, but there's this great, there's a bunch of quotes from Beckett that feel so psychoanalytical in lens, but um, one of them is, where am I? I don't know. I'll never know. In the silence, you don't know. You must go on. I can't go on, I'll go on. When we think about the body keeps the score, part of the of Van der Kolk's amazing work is that if you're not keeping the score because you're dissociating, you shut down, it hurts, something has to keep a record. But there's a record book. Your body is a record book of all the experiences of your lifetime, uh, through neurobiological synapses and, 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 and kicking back and forth memories to emotions and feelings to physical scars, right? And so one of the things that Vander Kolk talks about is, is when the body has been through trauma, it's kept the score and you're and accessing it, where we really want to, you know, you're living in flight, even if you don't, you're living in fight and flight constantly. Um, the body is under this kind of, uh, we call it allostatic load or else it's allostasis, you're carrying this with you, you don't even know. And the way through that is, affirming and seeing, but I love this quote from Beckett, especially the part that in the silence, you don't know, you must go on, you can't go on, I'll go on. And that feels like the tug of war I have with clients in trauma and, re and cognitive restructuring. I don't know what this is. There's a lot of silence in therapy. We sit in silence for a lot of time, just being together and holding space. And then I talk to them about trauma and, and restructuring the brain and cognitive restructuring and, and feelings of identity of safety. And they're like, oh, I can't do that. And I say, okay, I'll meet you where you're at. If you can't do that, what, where do we mm -hmm. from here? And many times people find resilience in their own time and way. And they say, I must go on. I have to figure this out. And mm -hmm. the thing I loved about that Beckett quote is it felt like it, it really speaks to Van der Kolk's approach to, to understanding where you are. You know, he and James Joyce used to sit together, they'd come into a room and they would just sit and not say anything and exchange this, you know, information through in a probably cellular, <laughs> cellular and literary and emotional way, which I, this image of that is always so beautiful. You talk about the resilience of your patients, your strengths based approach to working with people. And isn't it remarkable how resilient trauma survivors are in that um, to go back a little bit you said so we get into this place and we dissociate or we pull away or we do things that we're not even aware that we're doing and is that uh, is that what happens where you start to fragment you, uh, you and i've talked a little bit before about about integrating and pulling fragmented piece pieces of your personality back into the into the picture so that you're presenting a, a you're coming to the table with a full deck right a full deck of your personality cards um is 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 that it is that is that the thing where we we start to sort of fragment pieces that are too frightening or pieces that are associated with original event and we have to go back and 
and and sew that together, if you will? Is that the process of the work that we're doing? Yes, I you know there's an amazing mentor of mine. I'm gonna plug her here just because there's two people that have really informed my my passion for this work and. Um, one of them is Dr. Megan Corrado, and she is here in Philadelphia. She is the creator of the stories narrative that allows, it mostly is applicable towards um, more adolescent populations, but she, she works in trauma and, and teaching and instructing around trauma around the, the, the city and, and everywhere else. And she's wonderful. And, and Sandy Bloom is her mentor who created the sanctuary model. And people can Google that. It's really cool. Uh, model of approach in medicine. But the reason I'm bringing her up is because one time I, I really was struggling with my dissertation, my research, beginning to research artists and mental health. And I just could not explain what, how I wanted people to feel whole. And she said, you know, it's like a fract it's a sense of fractured self. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, if you break things, and we actually in her studio, she has a studio um, near Germantown where you go and you break glass and you build and you make something. And she's like, all those cracks, when you're gluing them together, that's the goal of trauma work, is to integrate our fractured self. And every therapist and psychologist, psychiatrist, doctor, um, counselor, everybody's approach might be different in how they help people. That's why it's all about the match. In, in clinical work. Not every therapist is the right therapist for you or clinician. And so my goal was always in working with intrinsic resilience and strengths. I'm, I'm very good at that part. That's the part I feel confident. I'm not always confident in every part of my job, but I feel confident in being able to see people's strengths just because when they're in the room, I know that they're strong. But they're in front of me. They, 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 they've already done so much. Mm -hmm. They've already picked up so many hardships in their life. If they're in front of me, they've got to be resilient because they're still here. And so that's where my strengths-based approach to it comes in. And, and part of fracturing is, is, yeah, there's a certain dissociation that happens. But much of that dissociation also is, is there's like a time stamp on it. And so a lot of my work with, with trauma survivors and even in my own experience as survivors, you, you, there's a Part of your life a time that feels frozen and, and kind of unruly or fractured or you feel bad when you think about it and you can't see why you may not remember the memories or you or you might remember essences but it feels vague you know mm -hmm. the memories feel vague yes they start to feel very vague and then when you talk about them they hurt but they're still vague mm -hmm. the work i think is when the memories become less vague and they hurt but they're less big. You, you can speak to them, you can speak to the color, temperature, the mm -hmm. tenants, kind of like in theater. It's like you put the, it's like tech. Mm -hmm. The show comes together and then you have something to see. And I, oof, that, I guess that analogy may be on my part. Good no, one. no. I mean, I think that, <laughs> is that because the brain, when you, you talk about resilience, the brain does what it needs to do, right? It's a fight or flight. It takes care of you. It pulls you out of that situation, be it, you know, a long-standing set of, of um, tr traumas that occur over a, a long period of time, or what you and I talked about, there are instances where someone has one, one, one specific incident that happens, be it a car accident, be it a, a witnessing of, say, 9-11, or something, where is there this tendency for us to minimize or put into category certain traumas and think, well, it happened a long time ago. There's nothing I can do to change it. I can't make it or shape it or work with it. So we'll just move on. Mm -hmm. And then you really don't realize that there is, you can't fully move on. Yes. That's, that's very, just so well stated, Tina, is that people, we try and break down trauma. I don't, I actually don't prescribe to the big T, little T trauma theoretical model. Some, mm -hmm. people, some clinicians really hold it dear. I think that trauma is very much, uh, it is, in, it is also informed by people's molecular structure, their neurobiology, their physiology. I think the body, what's traumatic to one person is not traumatic to another, but to categorize it as big T versus little T, uh, doesn't work for me because sometimes a thing like bullying over the long 
term can have, we've seen in research that can have just as many effects negatively um, and rejection and, and negative, you know, body image, things like that over the long haul are just as hard for the brain and traumatic for the brain as one time incident, you know, and I think we need to give credence. And I always tell my, my, I tell this to my clients, I tell this to my students, when I teach, I say this in the room as an artist, you, I want to trust that you are the worthy narrator of your own experience. I am not the narrator of your experience. So if you tell me that this was traumatic and you and it's affected your life, then we need to address it as so. Who am I to, to try to put it through a, a watering down of an assessment to say, you know, you're not, tra you're not traumatized, you're just upset. Mm -hmm. There's usually people are asking for supports. Their body's telling them something. And I see this a lot in creativity because trauma, it, it, it blocks impulse. Mm -hmm. It part of the, the, the goal is that the body's not as impulsive, it's always cautious. Mm -hmm. You know that you're scoping out the situation, you're looking, you're, you're trying to assess constantly, hyper vigilant. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that feeling when my clients tell me that because I, I, it was the hardest part for me as an artist. I remember being uh, completely, uh, until a couple even years ago, polarized in auditions. Like I'd be caught to the side as a type. And that was triggering. And then I think about these things and I, it would, I freeze, I would panic. Mm -hmm. I, I, my body wouldn't operate. It wouldn't remember dance routines. I couldn't sing the way that I would be at home because it just, there was something happening and I could never explain it. I just thought I, I didn't like auditioning or I was bad mm -hmm. at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, I just auditioned badly. That's what's gotta be. But, but I, isn't that, I, um, it feels like that's something that, we talk about as actors in in that situation. I just don't like auditioning. And then when you step back from it, you do realize that while there may be some nerves attached to it, to have the kind of sort of larger panic a attached is a triggering of certain of, of certain things from 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 the past, correct? Yeah. And or associations. Yes. The body may not know you're shaking, you're and we've seen this in auditions a lot, right? Somebody's in front of you shaking. Uh, they, they, they drop the papers. They, they're, they're clearly fren frenetic and worries, worried. And we just chalk it up. They're like, oh, they're nervous. The body might not see that as nervous. Uh, the body might see that as this is threatening. And especially, you know, I say this to casting directors a lot when they ask me about humanizing the room. I'm like, the first thing you can do is look up. You can just look up. You can digest those headshots later. The information is mm -hmm. going to be there later, but the person in front of you is not. So to spend the first 30 seconds of their minute in there, not looking at them, just saying start and looking over their credentials is, in my opinion, a little bit dehumanizing. What about looking them in the eye? What about checking in? Um, I just did a workshop on trauma for Villanova as they brought me back to, it was weird as a student to be brought back as an alumni, to yeah. talk to <laughs> members on how to treat their artists better. Villanova was just really trying to do the work of a trauma-informed pedagogy to acting. And um, James Imes is there and he is magnificent. And he asked him a phenomenal question. He was like, how do I humanize my audition? How do I make this more approachable? And I, my chest, my heart fell out of my chest because that question, I think we need to be asking industry-wide I think that these practices do need to change, you know, a lot um, in terms of a trauma. If we look at it from trauma, from my point of view, we have so much work to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and first is just humanizing these people in front of you. Right. When you look at the ways in which you can learn to inhabit the body fully and have it with you wherever you go, and uh, despite being triggered or despite, um, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion about how theater is a wonderful way to, to do that. One of the, that's one of the tools in addition to mindfulness and a lot of the work that John Kabat-Zinn was doing up in, in, in Boston, like many, many, you know, what, decades ago, some of that first work looking at how mindfulness, what does mindfulness and do for the body? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we know from mindfulness is it is part of cognitive restructuring. And so that's what makes it hard. Uh, first of all, it's a practice. So people, feel they drop it often because they don't, it's, it's not working at the beginning. 
And that makes all the sense. But that's why I love when they when it is referred to as a practice because the brain does not feel comfortable sitting, blocking out all external stimuli and sitting with itself because those the, the acknowledgement or the hypervigilance is what kept that body safe. And so you're asking the body to say, okay, the thing that kept you safe before, can we minimize that? And can we just be in trust? And mindfulness done well in different capacities. And again, like trauma is a broad practice, not just I think mindfulness can be lots of different things for different people because it's a state of being. But I think the, the important thing to do is to allow the amygdala to, to and calm down to, 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 to find ways to not be overstimulated all the time. And there's a, a sense of calm that comes out of that and presence. And it takes time to ask, and there's kind of a grace in asking your body to let go of its protective measures. Even though they were, they kept you safe at one point, they're maladapted at, at a much later point, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about these uh, sort of three areas of the mind. You have the amygdala, the sort of there's a fire in the house, there's a fire in the house, and then you have the the frontal, the the executor or the the organizer and the emotional person. And there's a shift that happens, uh, right? There's an imbalance there in 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 trauma. So you're trying to sort of reintegrate those sections, if you will. Mm -hmm. Is that the mm -hmm. I, I would think of it as um, allowing one to rest and one to activate more so that your ability, your ego functioning, your ability to self-soothe, to organize data, to, to can do a little more of that and your amygdala can do a little less of the fire in the house. Fire in the house, <laughs> exactly. Fire in the hole. There's a, is, yeah. that why, is that why we tend to forget things? Like you said, we would get into an audition and there's a fire in the house and meanwhile, like I forgot seven yeah. lines of because that and and it's also that connected back to why we forget why we forget aspects or pieces of what we might forget aspects or pieces of our history mm -hmm. repression um, is very big dissociation and repression yeah certainly mm -hmm. so how do you determine when you're when you're working with a patient? Um, you talk about there's certain aspects of yourself which is speaking to the the strengths based perspective of of being able to help and support because you're coaching as well, right? I mean that's part of it. Um, how do you how do you what is your sort of um, Magic is not a good word, but that's the one that's on the edge of my fingers. So I'm going to use it. It's a um, totally scientific word <laughs> what is your magic talking existentialism um, um, but i mean like how do you discern <laughs> it's like you know eye of newt in the thing but how, how do you, when you're sort of trying to assess is it just um how, how do you how do you decide that mm, i you know i i i think maybe this is part of the art of therapy is they is everybody has a different process some clinicians before they know you or build the report, do the assessment and trust that. I tend to do uh, a light screening. I leave the assessment into my first meeting with them, but I don't create a hierarchy and I try and really break down stigma. So I will let them know that I understand there's not going to be immediate trust right away. I understand that I, I have a role and I have a sense of power in our dynamic because I can either just you know, contribute to a diagnosis, di you know, diagnose something, work with their doctors, but I, I try and say to them, can we, it's your body and mind, can we work together? And they don't trust that at first. And I don't, I expect that they won't. So I do my assessment a couple of, of, of sessions later um, after I've built rapport because I find that when people trust and understand that you're not there to hurt them, that you're not there to stigmatize or pathologize them, they're more open to telling you what happened. And then you're able to more justifiably maybe challenge those thoughts. So when somebody says to me, this happened, but it's not really that traumatic. Then if I built rapport with them, I'll say, okay, you know, it sounds, it, that event or that time or that thing sounds really painful. We talk about that. Okay, it's painful. Like it's really impacting your life a lot. 
I talk about those impacts. Uh huh. And then talk about the impacts. And I say, okay. And it sounds like if those impacts weren't there, if that symptomatic response wasn't there, what would you? What would your life look like? Can we imagine? Can we envision a you without those symptomatic responses? And they go, okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd be more outgoing. I would do this. I would. I would connect this way, or I, I would. I'd become a this. And I'm like, okay. That's a. That sounds like a really nice option. Do we want to cut that out? Uh, it, it, can it still be an option? That's where the strengths come in. Like, I think that that seems pretty traumatic if it blocked all of these things from happening in your life. What do you, and I'm trying not to um, direct them, but more or less to allow for them to identify and go, yeah, I guess maybe so. And I'll go, okay, well, I think it's traumatic. You know, and I want to affirm and, and hold space where if you decide that you decide this felt traumatic for you, that maybe you'll let me do a screening now that we can call that trauma. And then, you know, but people tend to run away when you start an assessment, when you don't know them. You say, okay, I have these things we call the GAD7, PHQ9, this assessment, that assessment, managed care, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, it, every time I find that people, it, it creates a, a, a barrier to our treatment. Mm -hmm. and I, I think it's such a loss. And, and so my goal is, I, I do remember from theater, the best parts of our experiences, which are humanizing and beautiful and vulnerable. And then I remember the parts that are dehumanizing. And I try to make a therapy room feel the farthest it can from an audition room, if that makes sense. Like I remember auditions feeling cold and not friendly or uber friendly, like super friendly, just because I you already knew you had it. So they just, they're calling you in because of the courtesy, which is also not appropriate, but you know, whatever it might be. Uh, <laughs> But I try, and to, try not to go back to those feelings of me and across the table and another person, but just kind of like what you said, with Beckett, two people in a room, there's a cellular, natural mm -hmm. essence that is happening there. And I try and be humble and take a step back and say, you know, I'm, I'm humble to be here with you. It's, it's not, um, it's, a, it's a real humbling experience to hear somebody's pain. Yeah. I do think that's a beautiful, um, Beckett brought that beauty among other, you know, writers to the table, this idea of just sitting and waiting and having to deal with and be uh, fully uh, just in the moment of whatever that moment is. It does require a, a fair amount of courage, particularly if the house is on fire back here, you know, and <laughs> we want to, we want to keep moving. Um, a question here um, for you, Peter. How much of your approach is talk therapy versus something more physical, uh, especially uh, do you pull in your history as a physical trainer into the therapy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there is, there are modalities, there's licensees, you know, I have mixed feelings about certain approaches because as we build our clinical experiences and as therapy widens which and hopefully will become more variable managed care and um, specialization and um, competition so people start to to, to um, structure themselves and, and specialize and i think that there's a beauty in that and also a loss but there's a beauty in in that there's you know, sensory motor therapy, there's somatic therapy, and those are body therapy processes. Vander Koch has his own training modality for therapists and a whole school that you go through. And I do believe that those schools you should work within your scope of practice, but as a therapist, you don't have to be certified in something to bring in essences of it. It's like mm -hmm. artistic practice. And so I do, uh, I bring in, I'm a certified trauma professional. And so I bring in, that has a lot of body work. But I'm also a certified trainer, and there's so ethically I can bring in the bot and body awareness and, and sensory motor work into my work, and I do do that um, even over the over the screens now with telehealth. I find ways of getting us both in our body. I have um, I have this process now of painting my nails uh, with clients. Uh, I'll ask the aura will agree on the same thing. So I'll email them ahead of time and say, hey, I know that you said you wanted to talk about this topic and it's really painful. And you said it was painful, uh, especially I'm using this with a, a lot of clients in terms of um, queer affirming or, or uh, queer affirming experiences or gendered experiences that they want to work through or gender dysphoria. 
So I was like, can we both do the same thing? Uh, can we get some nail polish together? What are you having? Do you want, you're gonna have coffee, I'll have some tea or vice versa. We have something sweet. And I pull the screen as far as I can so they can see the things. And we just humanize together. It is talk therapy. And I do talk to them, but there's also something about if I can't ask them to be in their body, they're more willing to share an experience and that gets us in our body. So as oh. they're thinking, mm -hmm. They're kind of like dissociating a little bit at first, but then they'll show me their nails and go, oh, you know, like you're horrible at painting your nails. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, oh, you have to scrape the end, and then they're in their body, or they're they're talking about different things, or they light up. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for some people who were assigned a nail at birth, a good example is they've never painted their nails with another person. They were they didn't that wasn't allowed or that wasn't permitted for them, and I like to just give them a reparative experience that we both share that's human um and relational and humanistic and so uh, there are ways to get people in their bodies most certainly and uh sometimes I've, I've worked also with dance therapy elements and expressive arts so i yeah yeah very much so i think the body uh, getting people to sit with their bodies feels very very much similar to beckett for me i feel like they're in, in the therapy room i actually feel like things are on fire or, there's a tree, <laughs> there's a lot going on, and I'm asking you know, to stay mm -hmm. in the room. That they there, just connect, always connect. Mm -hmm. Just getting people to that place where they can get, let me ask you this. So in, in tele, telemedicine, or if you're doing a lot of, I assume you're doing most of your therapeutic work right now, wow. um, have you, has it offered opportunities for people who might, might, it might be hard for them to be Beckett and Joyce in a room. And so they can open up to you in a way because there is that screen. Have you noticed that? I've seen it go both ways. And this is the, I, I, I think, number one, I think there's nothing that can ever replace having us in a room together. Um, the therapy model rightfully is built on, on I, I don't like to sit at the head of, I don't like people, unless they want to, lying on a couch and free associating, but I don't like to create a hierarchy. I ask if they want that, I say, great, as long as you're asking for it and you feel comfortable, but I never like to create a hierarchy higher than them. It just doesn't feel good. Um, so the loveliness of telehealth, um, we've been doing teletherapy for many years, except the problem was it wasn't covered most of the time. So it used to be um, through better help or apps. Um, the thing that I've seen in the pandemic that's beautiful is there's two things happening right now. Number one, there's a shared experience. This is the first time that we both ask each other the same question, how are you doing today in the pandemic? How are you doing today in political unrest? Um, so that is things that are happening simultaneously and it, and it really breaks down some of the walls that exist. And then the other thing is you're being, so as a therapist, I, I, my first two years in residency in school, graduate school, you would, I didn't work, uh, I worked for a hospital, a trauma unit, um, and then I also was at a clear behavioral health unit in the zone center, but I would never be in somebody's home. Mm -hmm. Now, they, when they come on the camera, they see, they see my home, I see their home, uh, Sometimes they'll ask me things like, uh, where are you right now? And so I'm in my office here and I'll show them the office and they'll see things that normally they just wouldn't see. Mm -hmm. but, and I think there's a beauty in that. Uh, it breaks down a lot of, it, it was definitely uncomfortable for me. I think, I think this generation of therapists and psychologists and social workers, and we're all going to be writing the book actually mm -hmm. in this experience because this I have heard of. But yeah, I find that it allows people a vulnerability. You know, they can they turn on their camera. They're like, I'm sorry, I just didn't have the energy to arrive at therapy with the therapized prep self that you see. Usually, you know, they'll be more relaxed. They're in their environment. They are safe. This place is safe for them. Their home is safe. So yeah, it's, that, that's lovely. So yeah, I've, I've created experience. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, yeah. Ways, ways to make it work mm -hmm. um, or to explore aspects of it that just would seem so foreign and yet afford opportunities in ways that, you know, we wouldn't think. Um, you know, Peter, I'm thinking about 
you know, performing and just working, how anxiety is like the thing that'll kill a room faster than anything. So you're like, it's like lighting, you know, screaming in a, in a, in a movie theater, you know. Um, and yet I, I hardly know anyone who doesn't talk about it fairly, you know, fairly frequently, maybe less, less so now, but for different reasons now. But um, is your hope that we can all come to just sort of share a, a, an understanding about this, that it's going to produce some anxiety and the level of that will determine, you know, whether, sure, whether it's, it's coming about because of something else that really needs further resolution or what, but do you not feel like we really, or am I just missing that boat, that we really don't, it, it just clears a room real fast. Yeah. Yeah. Are you talking about in the creative process? Yeah. Well, well, just, just like you're, you're not, you know, here we are, we're not supposed to admit that that's a thing that happens because everybody's supposed to be very confident when they audition and, and and yet, uh, you know, the only way to get beyond this is to totally make friends with it. Yep. Like, come on, we're go come on with me, fear. We're we're going right in there, and we're we're in this together. Because isn't that part of it? Is if we bifurcate these areas off from ourselves, they only we only become more uh, alienated from them. Yeah, I I look at this through a lens of um, rejection bias. Um, and in, in research, I, I spend a lot of time with research and literature on the long-term effects of rejection and negative self-talk, body image, things of that nature, which if you think about it, let's like walk through this process real quick. You hand a photo to somebody that you had taken three years ago and you can't afford to get taken again because it costs so much money. You're already living under the poverty line and it's, and it's photoshopped. You hand that to somebody, they walk in, they don't look at you, you try and be vulnerable. They're, they're just looking at a picture and flipping it. They look up for 10 seconds, they ask you a couple questions, they give you an adjustment that maybe they didn't need to give if they would have been paying more attention the whole time, right, being present, or they give you an adjustment, um, and then they, they kind of kick you out of the room real quick. There's a lot going on there that you're interpreting, that they're interpreting, and nobody's talking about. And we all talk about, uh, and similar things happen in auditions and callbacks and trauma that clearly happens in our process too. Um, I hear a lot about that, uh, that I wish I didn't hear so much. I wish natures of trauma and marginalization of people in, in our field wasn't so rampant, but I hear about it a lot. And that's hard, that's hard to, to sit with. Um, but it does, it kills, it kills the, the process. Uh, and over time, people internalize these messages or they internalize a standard. And yeah, I think we all talk about it, but we don't talk about changing it. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. it just feels epic to change, but mm -hmm. I... It feels very individual. Mm -hmm. Like the, the individual is carrying it around. And I don't know, do you think it is that hard to... I, it, it seems like you're on... on onto it you're onto the trail of it raising awareness of it just if you change one room or one situation or one um yeah one event yeah i think i think it ha all change starts with small steps all change starts with just putting one foot in front of the other um people like james who asked how can i humanize an audition room uh a woman named Sherry Sanders is doing uh, from Rocky Audition gathered therapists from around the country who used to be artists or are still we're always artists but who aren't practicing as their full time job. Mm -hmm. uh, she held a roundtable with some colleges about changing pedagogy. Villanova said like what is trauma informed and what is traumatic about acting training and I was like I definitely have to talk to you about that. Yes, uh, the Actors Fund supported uh, Joe Biakness, uh Biakness. Via Casa, I can never say his name correctly, <laughs> even years later, and he laughs every time. Um, they're doing the work on, on ways that we can work with mental health on sets and in rehearsal rooms. Um, I think intimacy coaches, when working in their scope of practice, are great to have in the room. I think that there could be a world where you can have a therapist in the room for you know, certain dialogues on mm -hmm. you're doing dramaturgy. To make sure that those dialogues to, to navigate those dialogues and make people feel safe. Uh, yeah, th these things can be changed. It's about effort. And I think that people, I don't think people like change and I don't think that they like effort. Um, I think that they like the easiest route 
towards getting what they need and, and want. And I understand that. But I think if if we're going to change, I think it, it has to be commitment on all ends. Um, but I do think it can change. And I think it is, actually. But I'm curious if we can hold on to that change. That's what I, that's mm -hmm. what I challenge people with, mm -hmm. like challenge the unions with. And, um, I'll keep challenging. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Are, is a lot of the subject, do you feel like right now that you're feeling in the world, uh, it, is pandemic related anxiety that is uh, mm -hmm. separate from, it's hard to, I don't think you probably separate it, but separate, it, different than the fact that we're also experiencing a loss of work and a loss, as you said, of identity and a loss of, it's got to be very challenging to parse out which uh, fractals, you know, th it's coming from. Um, mm. You know, the, the, just the, the, because, you know, so on your daily walk with your friends or whatever, there's just the ongoing conversation that seems to get more and more uh, in, complicated and, and strange every day, really. And then in the backdrop of that, you have the, 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 the loss of work, or when will we be back on the stage? When will we, um, are you finding that people are identifying it more as the pandemic or identifying it more as a, a, a loss of artistic and creative outlet? Or are they able, are people able, or in general able to identify? That's a great question. I think it comes down to each person, but I will talk about some themes that, if it comes to everybody's biopsychosocial mm -hmm. world is different, but the themes, there's two things happening. Number one, there's ambiguous loss. So you don't, didn't have, you don't have jobs lined up because there's no auditions to go to, right? But, it, but you're, you're, you're mourning and grieving the loss of all those potential opportunities. That's a real thing. It's called ambiguous loss. Um, and I, I wrote an article about it a couple months ago to allow people, they're like, I, I don't feel the right to grieve the thing I never had. And like, oh, you most certainly can. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. grieve that all the time with other things in life. Um, you most certainly can grieve the loss of opportunity mm -hmm. since you've devoted your life. That's one thing. Number two, the other thing that I see a lot is I actually think, I don't think the pandemic is by any means a positive thing, but there is something happening that people aren't doing. And we always have all wanted the time to reflect um, to be in word, to, to and uh, a lot of people are being faced with to the time to answer or ask those questions, whether they want to or not. The brain is going there. They're 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 coming into sessions where people are contacting me. I'm getting a lot of <sighs> how can I do theater and not and also have this other quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, people reconciling that working with theater meant compromising other things, and they need to talk through it. They never sat with that. I, I'm seeing a lot of can I have um, multiple careers? I'm like, yes, mm -hmm. certainly can. There are dancer, artists, astronauts, literally in the company. Yes, you can. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the thing I'm seeing the most is, is people are upset over the losses, but also they're really impacted because all these things are bubbling up and they just don't have things to distract them the same way they normally do. Our lives don't allow us to distract. And then on top of that, there's an added level of exhaustion. Mm -hmm from the emotional energy of just living every day with a real true life altering threat. There is a disease that can affect us from breathing. And it's, it's hard, it's very, that's very hard because it, it's now, it's impacted every industry. But I think that this, there's other things that I'm, I'm advocating for us to change. Can we think about leaving more time and space in our lives? Mm -hmm. going forward can we work less and and empathize more and enjoy time can we not use work as an excuse not to be and can we can we have multiple versions of ourselves and just at once and um i hope mental health is you know destigmatizing this it's an important thing that we all need to do which is to talk about our story i think people need to tell their story in life whether it's on a stage or in a room with a therapist i think they need to be heard How are the ways in which your work um, as a therapist, are the, the ways in, are, are there ways in which your life is, uh, is illuminated in a way that it 
might not have been as an actor? Yeah, I wish I knew now what I, I wish there was some element of our acting training and pedagogy that I could have stolen from going to school to become a therapist. I think I would have enjoyed my job more. I think I would have had less direct trauma. And, you know, I talk about this a lot. I'm, you know, not ashamed to say I'm a survivor of trauma. And some of that happened through casting couches and it was not fair and not good. And, um, I wish, I wish I could go back. That's one thing I don't regret, but I wish I would have mm -hmm. understood that. Like, oh, it's okay for you to be panicked about this audition because auditions are dangerous sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to, oh, well, that's just, you know, I've had people say, well, that's just the way it is. And I looked back and I'm like, my goodness. Mm. Yeah, I wish, I wish that we, I think we need to have more psychological, psychoanalytic, self-reflective pedagogy streaming across all ways that we instruct people in, in academic ways. I think that we need to humanize academia largely as a whole. And I think that maybe we'll all be the better for it. And I'd love there to be a world where we can talk about, if we could talk about these things, then we can change them. Mm -hmm. Identify them. And... Mm -hmm. Will you continue to work as an actor, do you think? Where are you feeling strongly uh, poised to take off at this point? Um, do you think you will be that person that has the astronaut, the actor, the therapist, the... Yeah, I, I think I, I've, I've said to myself, I want to be a therapist, I want to be an artist, and I want to be a policy changer, and I want to be a diversity and inclusion advocate. And I decided my whole life will be all of those things. I with other people, you know, I, when other people try and limit, I just try not to, I try to funnel in versus funnel out. And yeah, actually a, a thought has been hitting me recently for the last two years about how auditions would look now. Um, mm -hmm. or, or when I get invited to do a project, am I saying no because I'm afraid or am I saying no because I, I just don't want to. And so I've been singing, you know, I've been holding myself accountable. I don't ask my clients anything that I wouldn't ask of myself in terms of being vulnerable. So I've revisited after a lot of reflective work on my, on my own singing again and uh, mm -hmm. coming again. And it is, I love it. I absolutely love it. <laughs> but I love it because I don't have to be paid for it. Or I love it because the union isn't making mm -hmm. it difficult. And I love it because... Um, I, it's, it truly is for me. And I'm wondering what it will look like when I can do it for me because I don't have to rely on it. Um, so there's not a, a break. There's not a, 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 I feel less fractured in my approach to art. And I, yeah, I often wonder what my, my artist self can make after, during, amidst all of this. Yeah. Yeah. I just one more question for you. Uh, I could, I could talk. We could talk for hours. <laughs> long time. We're just going to make this the, the weekly show where we call you in. And uh, uh, do you I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm totally here for it. <laughs> do you um do you feel that? Uh, do you learn as much as you teach? Do you think? Yes. Yeah. I. I think that I, I think there is a danger, in, in the idea that you can fix. I never look at clients that there's something to fix. I look at them as there is something to listen to, to ch reflect, to challenge, to look for blind spots. Um, yeah, and I'm constantly learning. I learn through their resiliency all the time. I think about my clients at the weirdest of times. It'll hit me like I'm going, like, oh, I can't do this. I'm like, oh, wait, this amazing person is doing all this work. He can. And it reminds me of just the human condition. Yeah, I we talk about it in theater all the time, yet I think we have dehumanized theater so much. But it's I, I, I look at the human condition as such a vast and possible condition of being now that I, because I get to sit with people in their most vulnerable selves, which again is the same thing I loved about theater. Mm -hmm. That's the part of the job I loved is the listen and react and the vulnerability, the give and take, the, the yes and, the believing in the possibilities. That, and that's the best part about being a therapist. Is mm -hmm. that, and, and then an educator, yeah. The beauty of the, of the purity of that, really, you know, you can feel you're really connected to the world 
like in a cellular way in your patient. So, well, Peter, thank you. This has been uh, really my pleasure to uh, learn more about the work that you're doing. And um, we will post, if, if people want to get in touch with you, how best to do that? Is it your website? Yeah, so they can go to peterandjanzig.com. Uh, they can go to theatricaltrainer.com and psychology today. Uh, they can uh, just put my name in there and they'll find me. And there's lots of multitudes of ways to reach me. And, you know, depending on what their needs are, you know, I'm, I'm happy to support in any way I can, even if it's giving resources or help, helping people find support. I, I never mind dropping an email and, and directing them if it's something I can't do. But I, I love hearing from people and yeah, and, and our stories to join in the research that I'm doing on artists and mental health. Yeah, anything. <laughs> and you are, taking, you are taking new patients? I am. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So people can contact me through Emerge Wellness or my website and uh, we'll, we'll do an assessment, see if it's a good fit. And yeah, I mean, I'm taking on people for new health. Sure. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and I look forward to continued research and just helping the communities to, uh, to figure out this time and as we come out and what that looks like. Uh, and I, I'm wishing you the very best with all that work. Thank you, Tina. And also the yeah. work that you're doing just oh. now has been illuminating and a thing to look forward to. And just even entertaining this conversation feels like an allyship. Uh, uh, wanting to help people. So I, I want to thank you for holding that space. Oh, no, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure. <laughs> All right. Be well. Take care. Okay. And thanks to everybody for joining us this evening. And I do hope you'll be with us uh, next Saturday, same time, same place, different background here on the, in the Zoom room when Priyanka Shetty will join us. She's an actor, she is a director, she is a playwright, and we're gonna talk about her full body of work, which is happening and uh, very been very well recognized at 2019 Broadway World Awards. And she's a playwright and got a solo show that she's working on, some very interesting work. So if you're on the IRC's mailing list, you'll get a link. Uh, if not, head on over to the IRC website and join us there. You can always come in on Facebook Live. And uh, we just really appreciate you sharing the word and letting everyone know these are the conversations we hope will illuminate uh, in our communities and beyond. And we can't do it without you. So we thank you for being here and just wishing you a very safe and a very healthy week ahead.